Hey guys, Jason over here at Cocky Farm. This is part three of the five part series of the three day ho hog workshop put on by Hen Hume Farm. And in today's video, it's all about the primal cuts. Getting the pig cut into the primal cuts or quartering cuts. So I hope you enjoy. Wasn't supposed to go this way when I met to do this yesterday. So we'll show you some, and you'll do it, and some of the stuff we'll just talk you through it. But we have two other halves, so if you don't get to cut on this half or one of these halves, you have to let us know so we can get you that opportunity as much as possible. So we don't use a whole bunch when we're butchering pigs. The bone saw is uh, is really handy to have. Round thing is a breaking, bone breaking. dust scraper. Um, so when we saw through bones, that creates a dust like like it does when you saw through wood. So that's you'll scrape along wherever that is, and it'll pick up all that dust, which is nice to clean up your cuts. Cleaver and mallet. We don't use a ton unless we're getting into pork chops. Um, which we'll do a little bit today. Most people haven't had a real good pork chop. For decades, the every single packet of pork that was sold in America had the USDA's recommended internal temperature on it at 165 degrees. And an entire generation of people in this country grew up hating pork chops. And, and rightly, they were tough, stringy, white. They were just not good. The pork lobby finally was able to convince the USDA to lower that internal temperature. So if you go to the grocery today, you will see 145 degree recommended internal temperature, which makes pork like pink and soft and actually juicy. But a lot of people have to get used to that. They're not used to eating pork that is either pink or red. But if you enjoy steak, you know that there is a very, very big difference between a well done steak and a rare steak. And if you fall somewhere in between, you can tell me why. Like there's an identifiable difference between those two ranges. And whatever your palate enjoys, the same applies with pork. So we're on some kind of a mission to get people to start really undercooking their pork. Didn't need you next to me. Am I the kind that you expected me? When they talk about a quarter, uh, if you're quartering a pig, usually they're just referring to half of that pig. Yep. Some people use the term primaline. But we're going to make a cut to take the front shoulder apart from the loin and the belly and the ham. That diagram up there is basically what we're going to do. That's from a guy named Adam Danforth. That's from a book that he did. So roughly that's what we're going to do. We're going to make a cut. And usually when we do this first cut up by the shoulder, some guys will count ribs, like how far over to go. We usually go at the end of the sternum. But if you like to count, it's usually um, either five, six, or six, seven, like if you're counting ribs from the front to the back. And we like using that, that method because if you hit the sternum here and go between the ribs, up here you're not going to run into the shoulder blade. Otherwise, if you come closer to the front to like extend your bacon, your belly, you'll get to the shoulder blade and have to saw through that. With this cut, usually, our knife will clip the cartilage end of the shoulder blade. And it also extends the front shoulder, um, which when Doug and I are talking about, we refer to the copa. In America, this section of the shoulder is called the Boston butt, and the bottom is called the picnic. This is great for pulled pork. You can make copa steaks. We usually uh, cure something called copa or capicola off the front shoulder, but it's excellent. Low and slow because of all the connective tissue. It's just delicious, and this meat is really nice and red. You can see the dip in the neck. Everything above the spine here is muscle with the fat on top of it. So those pigs can do an amazing amount of work with their nose because of that. Another of the cuts will be back here to separate the, the ham end. And we usually make that cut right here. But it's after this tail makes its turn, we go right there. And we'll make the cut and come across here to separate that side. And then we'll cut through the ribs to separate the loin from the belly. And those will be our four sections. 
Before we do any of that though, there's some stuff still sitting on the pig that we want to get out of the way. And that is the skirt, which uh, is the muscle that helps articulate the diaphragm. This is part of the diaphragm that's dried. And then the leaf fat, and sometimes the kidney would already be in here. This is where the kidney sat. I don't know if you guys can see it. It's got a little pocket there. I'm just pressing it down like this just to make it a little more malleable and make it easier to get to the leaf fat. The leaf fat comes right up onto the diaphragm and it's kind of connected right there. We're just going to make a small, small incision there just to release the fat away from the diaphragm. And I'm going to come all the way down and just, just lightly score between the leaf fat and where the skirt is all the way down to here. And then I'll be able to get underneath it and pull all this leaf fat away. So I'm just using my fingers to get up underneath the leaf fat. Once you get it started, How are you gonna render it? we're gonna grind it and then put it in the crock pots that Matt has over there. Yep. Cool. So you can start to see there's one of these um, facial planes we talked about a little bit with the jowls yesterday. Things start to separate and you can just kind of roll it up. Now another cool thing about this, this leaf fat has like a skin on it. So that skin, it's called the peritoneum, you can peel this fat off of it. This can be saved and after your copa is cured and off of salt, you can wrap it in this and tie it up as like a, a membrane to help your copa dry out a little bit slower. So the casing for the copa is the belly fat. In Italy they call it the pella di sunia, which just means skin of the fat. And the leaf fat, while we're talking about leaf fat, is different than some of these other fats. Even the soft belly fat is different than the back fat. This back fat's a lot harder, which is good for salami and things like that. This fat down here is good in bacon, but also good for uh, pâtés and things that are going to be emulsified. It whips up better into to meat than the back fat because the back fat stays solid. And this fat is very neutral, so if you're making pie crusts that you don't want to taste like pork, you render that separately. Right here, basically from the pelvis, just down here below the pelvis, all the way under the spine until about where the ribs start is where your tenderloin is. A lot of people refer to the loin, which is above the spine, as the tenderloin. It is not the tenderloin. The tenderloin sits under here. In Latin, it's the psoas major and the psoas minor. There's two muscles, but the minor is very small. So there are a couple ways to take this out. I usually like to get my finger right below the vertebrae and kind of pull down a little bit. And just I'm just pushing down to open it up. These vertebrae, their contour on the underside, everywhere there's a disc, that's these little gelatinous things. These are the discs and these are the vertebrae. So wherever there's a disc, there's a bulge yep. on the underside. So once you internalize that and know that, your knife can follow that. Sometimes when people haven't never done this before, we have them use their fingers because it's real easy to poke through a tenderloin. So you want to put your fingers in there and you can kind of see what I'm doing. Just pushing down and moving toward the head. If you start moving your fingers back this way because of the grain of the meat you, and it's so tender, you can run your finger right through the middle of the tenderloin. You don't even need a knife for that. So if you're doing it with your fingers, run your fingers that way. And it, like I said, it flattens out at the last rib. And as it comes down here, we're going to have to use a knife because it actually rides the, the one side of the pelvis here and goes all the way up into the ham. But you want to get it. So you want to trim it as minimally as possible. This is a little bit better of an example. So you're not taking off much meat with it. It's just right underneath the surface because this tenderloin will cook very quickly and you want it to cook very quickly. But it, because you're doing it so quickly, this stuff doesn't have time to break down. In barbecue, this would turn into flavor. On a tenderloin, it doesn't have time to break down at those temperatures and speeds. It's kind of knowing when you want to trim things. We would never do this on a shoulder. So for lunch, we'll cover this with salt and uh, pepper, garlic powder, and a bunch of herbs, and we'll roast it in the oven at like 400 for maybe 10 minutes. It won't take very long. Now it's time for quartering. Like I was saying, the first cut we're gonna make is this one. Um, when we talk about these, we usually start talking about the feather bones. We use, this is one of the only times we use this knife, because you want a clean cut. And this knife would do it, but sometimes if you have to like finagle and put the knife back in, you get some choppiness. So I'm right here at six and seven is about where the end of my uh, sternum is, which is where we're gonna cut. Um, 
depending on where the feather bones are, see on his half, you can see the bulge of the copa. Mm -hmm. There are no feather bones there containing it. All the feather bones are over here. So we'll have to saw. They probably won't have to saw. They'll probably be able to cut through all the meat and then fold this over to release it from the vertebrae and it'll separate. We will have to saw through ours, which is fine. Up here, we have no feather bones. So when we do our pork chops, it'll be a little bit easier. So someone is going to take this knife and plunge it at an angle as, as far up on here as they can get it. You know, you don't want to go straight down because then you'll have to cut back up here. If you get it at the lowest possible angle and go out this way, you'll have less to cut up here, which will reduce your risk of chopping it up. So you'll plunge it that way and not stab Cliff. <laughs> and then you'll and then you'll kind of go up and down with it, always keeping it as, on the table as much as you can. Cause on the table right now is a bunch of skin that we also want to cut. So it'll go through, and I would go in at like this angle to get it as high as I can. Work it down to the table, and then when you get it on the table, put your hand on the back of the blade to give you some more backward force, and you're gonna pull it through here. When you pull it through, step out of the way. <laughs> because you're gonna, you have to use some force to do this, and when you get it right here, you don't want to stab yourself. If you're nervous about that and you get it right here, you can always flatten the handle and cut down to the table that way if you want. It just yeah. didn't separate like yeah, one, did it? Yeah, it's right there. There you go. Okay. Oh, I see. You just it. work your way through. If I were to start to pull. If you want to put this that, hand on the yeah, back of the knife to help work it, work it through, you can do that. It's right there. Mm -hmm. All right. Mm -hmm. And sometimes when you cut, like between four or five or five six, yeah. you'll clip the cartilage end of the shoulder blade. You'll cut through that, which is you, the knife will do no problem. I said earlier that that's what horses together. Nice smooth cut. Nice, nice, nice. Now we're not completely separated. There's a cut back here, and it sometimes helps to do this. Sometimes. So you have a little bit right there to cut that skin and you want to keep your knife right in that cut as much as you can and bring it all the way down this way. Just a different way to do this. And then plunge the tip in to make sure you get all the loin. Okay. And you can stop. You'll probably hit a feather bone there and then you can take the knife out and we'll saw the rest. So see there's where your cut came through. You're going to saw through that section of the spine. You can actually pull it apart there. So you, this way you'll be able to drop your handle a little bit to make sure you get through the spine. There you go. So this is the end of the loin. So the loin, the loin eye, which is this paler part here, is the end of it here and it runs all the way down to here. So this could still be a pork chop. We cut, in the American style, we cut into pork chops. Well, they would have had probably two more pork chops here. In America, they shorten this because they don't value this as much as the pork chops. So then this is the copa up here. Have some spare ribs and this is belly. You can see the the bacon on this side, which is looking pretty nice. Yeah. Yep. It's a good fat to lean ratio for sure. The next thing is where this vertebrae is. Same thing, almost identical to what we did down there. We still have the feather bones. Uh, you want to get the lowest angle you can, almost parallel to the table if possible. Sometimes we cut this uh, disc because your knife will go through the disc. But it's not going to go any further than that, but that's just a marker. You're going to put this knife underneath all the way through to the table and out. And then get it all the way to the table and then pull through, yep. And you already got, kind of got a cut there. There you go. Okay. Just make sure you finish that cut to the table. That help. And then we'll saw through the bone. Yep. Boom. So, this is not in four pieces yet. We're quartering this. The final quarter, or the final two quarters, are right through here. We're going to cut through here. Our main obstacle is that there are bones right here that we need to saw through. But there aren't bones right here. The main thing we want to check is that we get the pork chop we want. Okay. Usually, like, 
if you've ever seen like the tomahawk pork chops, mm -hmm. you know, they can come down all the way to here, but again, you're losing belly, and I know Matt likes bacon. So usually we make a mark right here, just like a little nick with our knife, and then you do the same thing down here, and it usually ends right there at that fat spot. We'll make a cut right in here-ish. And I'm just making a mark there so whoever is cutting this can see. And then I'm just kind of looking down here and it's gonna, we might not hit that line exactly. And so it's gonna be cut here. When you do this cut, you wanna make sure your knife goes straight down to the table, not like this, because then you'll start cutting into your loin. But I know that my last rib, with a little bit of exploration, I think is this guy. I don't feel another one. So you can make a cut straight down and cut this because there's no bones there and then saw this and this these bones are not very thick so the sawing is just like a superficial flat sawing to get through those bones and then we'll finish the cut with the knife Now flatten out your, your saw so you're cutting just across the bones and not into the meat as much as you can. You might want to come forward a little bit. There you go. And now you cut the rest. This is always a good thing to see. Kind of like that poster up there. It's worth it because it's really really on the back of the pig. So that's the corner. Wasn't supposed to go this way when I met you yesterday. I didn't need you next to me. Am I the kind that you expected me to be? It's getting a little warm. Crack the window, please. I'll pump the gas if you run inside Grab a couple tall boys and a honey pie and Yesterday is far away and tomorrow 